Christmas is supposed to be a time of joy and celebration. The beauty of watching the snow gently fall and cover the ground in a blanket of white powder is almost mesmerizing. The intoxicating smell of pine when you look for a tree fills the air, followed only by the scent of fresh baked Christmas cookies for Santa. The shimmers and shines of all the Christmas lights and decorations turns your local town and neighborhood into a winter wonderland. And what could ever compare to seeing the joy on your loved ones' faces when they open their presents and check their stockings to see what Santa left them as they sip on their hot cocoa? However, not everyone's Christmas goes according to plan, and I don't mean your airline canceling your flight at the last minute. Sometimes, Christmas is anything but merry. After hearing this tale, you may want to start a local neighborhood watch. The legend goes that there was a mother and a son, the Euclids, who lived together on the far end of the cul-de-sac on K9 Street. Ironically, the Euclids were your stereotypical quote-unquote crazy cat family. Some who swore they knew them would claim that they had an unhealthy obsession. The mother, Marissa Euclid, would take in strays monthly after being retired from her job at the metal manufactory after 40 years of dedicated service. However, being 60 years old, she became more and more sedentary, and her mind started to go. Her son, Derek Euclid, who was 25 years old, was far from what people would consider normal, at least most people. He became rather closed off, and an outcast ever since his father passed away when Derek was only 14 years old. Once he noticed his mother's health deteriorating, he essentially became a live-in nanny. Everything went swimmingly. Well, as swimmingly as can be given the circumstances. Unfortunately, they had a major bump in the road when Marissa's retirement money was about to run out and they did not qualify for any assistance. Derek had to get a job at the local supermarket to help ends meet, which meant leaving his mother home alone for a few hours when he had to work. Little did Derek know that this Christmas would be the one that sent him down in history as a legend. The story goes that on Christmas Eve, Derek had taken care of his mother as per usual and left for work. He was tasked to work in the meat department that night with assisting the butcher. The butcher was an odd character who suffered from a severe mental illness, which is why parts of the story cannot be confirmed. The butcher at the time, Mr. Yellowstone, who coincidentally looked like St. Nick, with his red nose, jolly frame, and bushy white beard, insisted that Derek stay after closing as he had a, quote, family emergency. Locals say that the so-called emergency was the bar beckoning him. With no other choice, he called his mom and said he would be home later. Once Derek was about to leave, he noticed some local youths leave what was once the corner liquor store. They were already intoxicated and were buying more. One might say that they had enough alcohol on them for a frat party. They spotted Derek leaving and immediately hurled insults his way, calling him every name in the book. They mocked him for being a loner and his mother and her continuous mental deterioration. Him, being a weakling, chose not to act upon his admittedly justifiable urges and walked to his car. They sped off, but not before throwing a full natty light can at his windshield. Because he did not want to go home angry, he took the scenic route home to calm down. This is where the story takes a darker turn. He returned home to see that both of his front windows had been smashed in. In a panic and concerned for his mom's safety, he vaulted into his house and was immediately greeted with the sight of his mother dead from multiple gunshot wounds to the head. All of their 10 cats had sadly been killed by multiple stabbings. The amount of blood and gore he witnessed that night could not even be compared to what he's seen in the most violent horror movies that were out at the time. There was so much, the horror movies would have appeared like an anthill compared to the mountain of blood and gore he saw that night. He then noticed something in the snow. He hopped out the same window and got a closer look. It was an empty netty light can. Almost on cue, they drove past hooting and hollering and meowing condescendingly at Derek. He was frozen in a white-hot rage that should have melted the snow around him. He called the police to file a report, but they were useless. 
Derek had not managed to get any plate numbers, as there were no plates on the car, and they sped away so quickly, he could not even get a good look at the car make and model, only the car's blue color. Having felt defeated, he simply went back inside and cleaned up the glass, boarded up the windows, and drank himself unconscious. The next morning, with his mother's Jack Daniels in hand, he walked through his neighborhood in a drunken dazed fury. Here is where the facts get slightly muddled. Locals said that he was chasing after a stray cat while meowing to get its attention. The cat had apparently led him to the youth's house. He immediately smelled the stench of beer, hard liquor, and vomit. The car that was poorly parked in the front yard was identical to the one that was seen driving off. Not only that, apparently also in a drunken daze, the youth had left the murder weapons on the floor of the car. Derek marched up to the front door and banged on it with all of his pent-up aggression. Locals said that the door practically came off of its hinges. One of the youths answered hungover and reeking of urine, alcohol, and a disgusting musk. He was the driver who had thrown the beer can at him the night prior. Shane Terrence was his name. Shane initially greeted him with a disgruntled groan. However, that groan turned into a mocking smile. Hey, it's the cat boy. Don't you think you should be drinking some milk instead? I'm sure your mommy would. Oh wait, I forgot. <laughs> the laugh that was heard all throughout the street, the locals claimed. Through his slurred speech and with the fury of the gods in his voice, Derek demanded that they apologize and atone for their actions. Why should we? You two freaks were driving the value of the cul-de-sac down. All the cats crapping everywhere made it stink to high hell. Heck, we practically did you a favor. It's not even worse in your house thanks to your dumbass mom and her thinking the couch was the toilet. Don't even get me started on the walking flea bags you call the cats. Those raggedy looking things. Ha! Huh. Their last meow sounded like they were gargling sandpaper. Get the hell out of here unless you want the same thing to happen to you. And don't even think about calling the cops again. Not even the fire department would be able to rescue you from the tree after me and my boys are done with you. And with those final, venom-filled words, the door was slammed in Derek's face, and he stood there with his fist clenched so hard, local said blood was dripping from his palms. He turned around slowly, seemingly having sobered up instantly, and ran with determination and tears in his eyes back home. Although this cannot be confirmed or denied, the locals claimed that Derek had screamed the entire way home. However, it sounded like a battle cry historians have never discovered. The last anyone saw of him that day was him retreating into his father's garage where all the power tools were stored. That house lay quiet until that night when Derek emerged, a transformed beast.